goals of, of this area for him. Rhetorically, however, and, and Professor Howard and I uh, are uh, people who primarily study uh, presidential rhetoric, um, rhetorically, Bush did not take full advantage of the, what we call the chief legislative tools that modern presidents possess. So we'll talk a little bit about the theoretical framework that we used, um, which is thinking of the president as chief legislator. And we have not always, uh, as presidential scholars, considered presidents to be chief legislators. This is something that in the 20th century we began to think about and refer to. And furthermore, in that century, Congress then began to expect this kind of leadership out of the president as well. So we came to call presidents uh, this, this moniker, or a hat, if you will, uh, of chief legislator. And they have certain goals, uh, presidents as chief legislators do. And some of these we can glean from congressional uh, literature, uh, people who study members of Congress. And so one of the goals that both members of Congress as well as the president as chief legislators have is to make public policy. This is why they get into office, presumably. They want to affect things for the positive. They want to make good public policy. Members of Congress want to do this as well. And in pursuing this goal, uh, Congressional scholar David Mayhew tells us that presidents will engage in what we call position taking. They will take positions on policy issues. And in doing this, they will detail a, a problem that they see. They will present solutions that they hope to get adopted. They oftentimes will use symbolism in the way that they talk about uh, these policies, all in the attempt to sell, if you will, this vision that they have. Another goal that chief legislators have is um, re-election. Legislators have this, this goal too. Now, for a president, obviously, you only have one attempt at re-election, but nevertheless, this is another goal. And um, you want to demonstrate your effectiveness in this role by um, claiming credit for what you have done. And what you have done are typically going to be policy accomplishments of some kind. A final goal that, um, I lost track of my slide here. A final goal is to um, secure uh, your legacy as president. Presidents want to secure a positive legacy. And pursuing um, the public policy goal helps in that regard. Obviously, gaining reelection helps in that regard. Um, but one of the things that uh, you want to do is have history think well of you. And so presidents will campaign in their re-election campaigns on things they have accomplished. They will talk again about what they would do in a second term. And then if they are lucky enough, as uh, George W. Bush was, to secure a, uh, his re-election, then um, your thoughts turn to um, how you will establish this legacy. So now to the faith-based initiative. Um, that's kind of our, our theoretical framework. We view the faith-based initiative as what we might think of as a signature initiative or a pet project, if you will, where it's a policy innovation. And certainly this didn't spring from um, just the mind of George W. Bush. There were elements of this in the 96 welfare reform law, for example. Um, but when we think about a signature initiative of any president or a pet project, we think of it as a policy innovation or idea. Um, something not really previously on the agenda, or at least immediately so, that the president advocates, personally cares about, and wants to see advanced. And focused attention on the part of the president can place it on the agenda. And as we view this, rhetoric is key, uh, as audiences need to be educated about the project and informed what the president's vision is, because it's not something that's, that's typically ongoing. So, what we look at in our, our case study uh, and how the president talked about faith-based initiatives um, is really how Bush exercised his chief legislative powers to talk about the importance of the faith-based initiative, both to Congress as well as the public. And in looking at how he talked about this, our data uh, is from the weekly compilation of presidential documents. And so we utilize those to assess, assess both quantitatively and qualitatively how Bush rhetorically highlighted the case that he wanted to make for the faith-based initiative. The weekly compilation will contain written remarks, it contains uh, written documents, it contains speeches, uh, all of these documents that are produced by the administration. So we utilize these documents, we looked for mentions of where the president had talked about um, faith-based. And in looking at this, um, 
we can look to some other scholars in terms of how to classify these speeches. Obviously, all speeches are not created equal. And so major speeches are um, speeches that are addressed uh, to national audiences on television and during primetime television viewing hours. So the president is trying to maximize the audience that he is um, looking to. There are also a number of minor addresses that we look at as well. Um, one classification of these are radio addresses. With Reagan, um, the president started the weekly radio uh, address. And so those are a separate category in terms of minor remarks. Remarks to specialized audiences uh, are remarks to identifiable groups or constituencies, which would include re-election audiences, um, remarks to party entities, interest groups, et cetera. Televised minor speeches. So these are speeches that are not in prime time. These could be interviews, news conferences, those kinds of things. And then we have miscellaneous remarks, which are remarks that are made after official meetings, nomination announcement, and other official functions. So we classified these in terms of um, where Bush was talking about in what kinds of uh, documents and speeches in this instance. Bush was talking about faith-based initiative. And as we can see from the data that we compiled here, um, Bush was most active in rhetorically talking about his policy proposal one in his first term, especially the first year, and uh, especially in the year of his reelection in 2004. Um, and also, he was very active in talking about faith-based initiatives to specialized audiences. So as an example, on the day that Bush signed his initial two um, executive orders, which was on January 29th, uh, so nine days into his, his first term, um, he spoke to the fishing school in Washington, D.C., a faith-based community center. And at this, uh, in, in this speech at this school, he said this, here are some of my proposals. I want to fully open up the federal after-school program called 21st Century Learning Centers to all after-school programs, including faith-based groups. I propose to create a compassionate capital fund, which will provide startup funds for promising new programs serving people in need. We'll make sure that funding is available to faith-based programs on an equal basis with non-religious alternatives. Government, of course, cannot fund and will not fund religious activities, but when people of faith provide social services, we will not discriminate against them. I propose to encourage mentoring programs for children or prisoners, as well as programs that, when possible, help to mend broken families. Subsequent speeches uh, in the next week following that were given to Catholic Charities, uh, a Republican congressional retreat, and at the National Prayer Breakfast. But simply looking at speeches and where this is mentioned and how they classified, uh, how these speeches are classified is, is not quite all we want to know. We also want to look more qualitatively at, at this. So examining frequency is important, but it's not the full picture. So we also want to look at what kind of attention the president uh, gave to this issue in speeches um, where he discussed faith-based initiatives. So we classify our major and minor speeches here again, but looking more at what is being said in these speeches, we look at where the speeches may be focused, where attention is devoted uh, in the speech to faith-based initiatives and not other policy issues. Um, mixed, where there's some space for discussion explanation, but other policy issues are given some kind of similar treatment. And then cursory, where there's merely a mention of the policy issue, but no space really devoted to explanation or in-depth discussion. And so we do see Bush right off the bat with his joint address to Congress in February of 2001. This functions kind of like a State of the Union address, although technically it's, it's not a State of the Union address. He devoted a, a significant amount of space uh, in this major speech to his vision. Now, it's a mixed speech because in a State of the Union address, one talks about a whole host of things. But he did, did uh, talk about the speech with a quite large, uh, lengthy quote, which I won't read um, here as I'm running out of time. But um, he talked more again about the various aspects of the faith-based initiative, uh, which was actually a, a variety of things. And interestingly enough, one of the things presidents typically do at State of the Union addresses is, is also introduce people. And he also uh, introduced Philadelphia Mayor um, John Street, who was actually a Democrat, um, who had been incorporating faith-based programs in, in the city. And Bush was seeking uh, to push this, these initiatives in a bipartisan fashion. However, one of the other things that we see presidents doing in State of the Union addresses is um, to claim credit. And Bush had already signed the two executive orders um, that uh, had established the Office of Faith-Based Initiatives in some of the, de the um, executive departments and the office at the, the cabinet level itself or the executive level itself. Um, but he doesn't mention these. So he doesn't go into any kind of um, claiming credit for the executive accomplishments that he already had. And in um, 2001, we see that Bush gave 16 focused minor addresses 
the most of the concentrated attention that he would give this, uh, this initiative. So at the same time, Congress is moving um, on this. In the summer of 2002, the House passed the, the Watts Hall Bill, H.R. 7, which contained the main charitable choice provisions. And um, on this occasion of it passing out of, of both the committee and the House, Bush merely in, uh, issued written statements. He didn't make a speech on these. Um, in the, the Senate was moving uh, that summer, but was unable to act on the bill. And Bush did give a focused radio address on charitable choice on August 18th uh, and urged constituents as Congress went home to their um, uh, summer recess to contact their senator regarding the bill. But at the end of the 107th Congress, um, the administration decided to address their policy preferences administratively. So they were not able to get much traction in Congress and they decided to move uh, executively. And so Bush signed uh, Executive Order 13279, Equal Protection for the Laws of Faith-Based and Community Organizations, um, that would allow federal aid to go to religious charities even if they discriminated in hiring practices. Um, and this was a key part of uh, aspect of the congressional bills. And Bush, we all oftentimes see presidents have signing ceremonies for legislation that they sign. Bush had a signing ceremony for the executive order in which he talked about um, this, his signing this aspect uh, of, of correcting discrimination, that religious entities had been discriminated against in terms of funding, that some of them hadn't been able to compete for this funding. And he talked about it in that kind of fashion. And in this speech, Bush emphasizes his executive powers, his unwillingness to compromise, and legislative action at this point was effectively dead. Now, Bush also had a number of small legislative successes. Um, the, compassionate, the Compassion Capital Fund uh, had actually garnered $30 million. The Mentoring Children of Prisoners Fund had been legislatively accomplished. Access to Recovery, another uh, program, had been uh, legislatively accomplished as well. But Bush, uh, again, does not claim credit for these particular uh, accomplishments. And then as the Bush-Cheney campaign geared up in 2003, um, and especially into 2004, the remarks that Bush made became very cursory. And typically, uh, in, especially in 2004, from March 2004 on, uh, Bush began to simply mention that we stand or we support the fair treatment of faith-based groups. Now, this had already been accomplished with an executive order, but that is the language that, that the, the campaign used as they went on the cam tra campaign trail. So we saw a shift in rhetoric. Um, and Bush, again, also does not claim credit um, for the accomplishments that he had, which is kind of unusual because in other um, research that we have conducted on Bush, he's actually not shy about credit claiming, but he did not do that in this particular area. And so to uh, go to the conclusions, uh, what we find in terms of the way Bush talked about uh, this particular policy area, um, Bush was able to accomplish some of his policy goals, though this was largely done through executive powers, uh, however, and not legislative ones. When talking about the faith-based initiatives, um, he, he tended to address specialized audiences and did not use uh, extensive uh, explanations to educate audiences on his preferences. And so we find he wasn't very active in using his rhetorical tools, if you will, to sell um, his policies. He had a very um, peculiar credit claiming pattern in that he didn't do a whole lot on this issue. And again, uh, it wasn't as if he was averse to this kind of behavior because in other areas we do see him engaging um, in that. And so uh, a question is why Bush-Cheney events we know uh, were really meant to rally the base. And by resorting to one sentence boilerplate plate that doesn't claim credit, um, perhaps Bush was simply using it as a rallying point without acknowledging any uh, accomplishments and thus retaining it as a campaign issue. Or it could be that because Bush still wanted action at the congressional level, which he did, um, to make permanent what had been done with executive order. Uh, he was really rallying support for this, but not in a way that it really exhorted anyone to action. So his remarks became cursory, and the uh, intent of that is really difficult to discern from what we look at. And um, finally, Bush's approach to uh, this policymaking area um, was actually not legislatively centered. It turned out to be um, executively centered. And he quietly executed the main element of his policy preferences. This affected his rhetorical approach. He was less active in articulating, defining, and promoting his pet project. He was less active claiming credit for his reelection and legacy purposes. And at the root, chief legislative powers are rhetorical in nature. Uh, rhetorical powers stem from the chief legislator role where president is given the power to report and recommend to Congress. And so relying more on executive powers that are unilateral was key to how Bush pursued this particular pet project. 
And so in the area of faith-based initiatives, we find that Bush really uh, was foregoing the role of chief legislator and being more executive-centered, and this affected his rhetorical behavior. Uh, so I've been invited to speak, uh, and I will. Uh, thank you very much. That was a wonderful presentation, and uh, I, uh, I very much applaud uh, the effort uh, in the paper. And, uh, and I've had the occasion over the last dozen or so years to there's a fairly robust literature now in political science and other you know, related fields on, um, on this aspect of the Bush presidency by people like Amy Black at Wheaton and uh, Joanne, uh, uh, Joe Renee Formicola, Mary Seegers, and others. And I think your paper's in that great tradition and adds a good deal, so thank you. Um, so let me, let me uh, reading about these things and hearing about them, in some sense, it's like an out-of-body experience. And with a body like mine, that's very welcome. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but uh, because, you know, when you're there, you, you can't, you know, you can't quite see it from the, the bird's eye view. You know, you see it from, the, you remember it from the worm's eye view. So what I'll contribute uh, to the extent I contribute anything at all is just a, a bit of the worm's eye uh, view. And so it, it, the first thing to note, I would note in relation to, to the paper and the thesis um, uh, is that the, what, what became HR 7 uh, was first going to be HR 1 or HR 2. It was really the very first thing out of the box. And part of the reason it wasn't HR 1 or HR 2 is because it wasn't entirely clear that there was a, um, a uniform consensus on exactly what should be in that bill. Uh, there were multiple and competing groups and ideas within the congressional uh, Republican uh, uh, group on Capitol Hill in the House. Uh, there were some disagreements and you know, emphasis and accent uh, within the White House. And the bill that eventually gets reported up and out is H.R. 7 and eventually passes pretty much, I think 15 Democrats voted for it at the end of the day. So, you know, by today's standard, that would be a bipartisan bill. <laughs> then it was considered a virtual party line vote, but today that would be like a remarkable bipartisan achievement. Um, but um, the, 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 as, the, as it was going through the process, the main objection to the original language of H.R. 7, which had already been made public, came from the House Judiciary Committee. It came from Representative Sensenbrenner on the Judiciary Committee, who basically called uh, the White House more or less to account because of certain provisions in the bill that he interpreted as having had, uh, as, as having essentially done a version of what that executive order eventually did, which is to sort of expand the range of conditions under which religious nonprofit organizations could receive funds and yet use those funds in hiring only their own co-religionists. So he objected to that and other aspects of the bill. At one point, um, I went to Capitol Hill uh, with John Bridgeland, who was here uh, earlier today at the 1030 panel. And we uh, met with a range of uh, people on both the Democrat and the Republican side. I think this was in June of, of 2001, so just about a month before uh, you know, the vote uh, on the bill, uh, thereabouts. And, and, uh, Mr. Bridgeland um, made a statement uh, that was picked up in the press that the bill, yes, we, you know, the White House agreed that the bill needed to, quote, be brought back into line with the Constitution, close quote, uh, which was an interesting day for him in the, in the White House. <laughs> Usually it was me you know, having interesting days, but he had a very interesting day that day in the White House. But the point was that we were reflecting um, what we, you know, what the uh, requirements were from, from Representative Sensenbrenner, but also, you know, the Senate, which although obviously it was yet to be heard from and eventually would, you know, as largely frankly expected, not act on that version of the bill, people like the then uh, Republican senator of my state, Pennsylvania, Arlen Specter, who had a very kind of strict constructionist view on church-state separation, let it be known that not only would he not support such a bill were it to come to the Senate, but that he would actively oppose it. So, you know, so there were modifications made to H.R. 7. So the H.R. 7 language, if you go back and look at the you know, it's fascinating, the debate in, you know, on the floor, they're actually, in many points, debating the previous version of the bill. <laughs> so they are fighting over and defending and opposing language which has been stripped from the bill. 
So that bill passes, uh, and uh, it is obvious that it's not going to be a you know a, a cakewalk or any such thing in the Senate. Now, with regard to the thesis about you know going to executive order, and then of course later on it's executive orders, and then a certain uptick in signing <coughs> statements, and 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 all all that apparatus of sort of that version of an administrative presidency. Just a couple of quick worm's eye view uh, observations. One is that on September 11, 2001, as I was waiting for the president to come back to Florida, which would have been, you know, which was my last official day was September 15th, but my last actual in house day was September 11th, and uh, I was waiting for like a two o'clock, you know, photo op. See you later. Um, and I had in my breast pocket the draft of a bill, not an official draft, but something that Senator Clinton and Senator Santorum had worked out in July of uh, 2001. Uh, they each came to the White House. There were back and forth negotiations. So had 9-11 not happened, in addition to a whole host of other things that where the world would have been uh, uh, different, um, there probably would have been a, an initiative that would have come from the Senate on a genuinely bipartisan basis. The bill was not radically different in all respects from H.R. 7, but it was different enough that it could actually satisfy concerns of people like Senator Specter on the Republican side. And then actually Senator Kennedy uh, was not, uh, you know, was not opposed uh, to that version of the bill. So, you know, it's the, sub it's the subjective, conditional, woulda, coulda, shoulda, might have been a version of the counterfactual history, which is no history at all. But uh, there's, there's, and then finally, with respect to the, uh, the uh, point about, you know, the president speaking about the initiative, not credit, claiming credit for the initiative, what he had already done with the executive orders and the changes in funding and the implementation of the level playing field report that came out in August of 2001. It is absolutely, you're absolutely correct uh, that it, there's a dramatic fall off and then you get the December 2002 executive order and so forth. But one aspect of this, again, from the worm's eye view is that there's a dramatic increase over that period of time in the extent to which members of the White House Office of Faith-Based and Community Initiatives and the people in the centers are going out doing, you know, everything from coffee clutches to major, you know, gatherings of hundreds, in some cases, close to a thousand people uh, on the part of my successor, uh, Jim Tui, uh, the directors of the five centers for faith-based initiatives in the cabinet agencies. Um, they, they go out and basically, it's not the president to be sure, but there's a dramatic increase in that. And that really is sustained all the way up through the 2003, 2004 elections. So, so those are just some worm's eye view observations, um, which is which, none of which um, count as uh, falsifying evidence of any kind, but just simply to complexify the picture a little bit. Uh, and so again, I thank you for your wonderful paper and uh, I will stop there. I, I too want to offer thanks for this paper. I uh, was not in the White House other than visitors toured a long ago. Uh, so I don't have the perspective that my colleagues can offer on this. So what I thought I would do is try to contextualize a little bit what you were talking about and more broadly George W. Bush within the tradition of evangelical social action. Uh, I do want to say that in reading through the paper and reading some of the rhetoric surrounding the faith-based faith initiatives, I was very impressed with it. It was, it, it was really... Uh, I thought very excellent, and the the goals in this program I think were really quite quite worthy. In part because, uh, again, putting this in a historical context, if you go back throughout American history, you see that religious groups, particularly evangelicals in the 19th century, were very active in these sorts of initiatives. That is to say that evangelicals were very, very concerned about those on the margins of society. They were very concerned about the plight of prisoners and prison reform generally. They were very concerned about uh, equal rights for women, for example, and voting rights in, in the 19th century. And these sorts of philanthropic activities on the part of evangelicals, I think really were lost in, in, in the Great Depression uh, when, the, when the, uh, the crush of social problems became so great that the, the government had to step in and provide some relief. 
And I think the great tragedy, frankly, is that uh, when the economy did recover after the Great Depression, religious groups did not resume that responsibility within society. So I would, you know, just to kind of complexify the argument even more, I would argue that something like the faith-based initiative should not have been necessary at all. That is to say that tax exemption is, let's remember, public subsidy, effectively. And these groups should have been using their tax exemptions, public subsidy, to be engaged in these processes and not need government encouragement. Encouragement, but of course that's not the case at all, as, as, as we know. I, I just want to provide a little bit more context for for evangelical social, social action going back uh, now about 50 years or so. Uh, in the fall of 1973, over Thanksgiving weekend, there was a remarkable gathering of 55 evangelical leaders in the uh, YMCA in the south side of Chicago, and they came up with a, de a document called the Chicago Declaration of Evangelical Social Concern. And this is really a remarkable uh, document, and I encourage you to read it. It's uh, widely available on, on the internet. But what I find found so striking about this document is that it does go back to many of the 19th century evangelical causes that were so important in the formation, not only of evangelicalism, but of the nation itself in the 19th century. It decried the persistence of racism in American society, for example. It uh, criticized the the extensive militarism in American society, and of course that was right at the, at the end of the Vietnam War, so that criticism was especially uh, pungent. Uh, it criticized the uh, growing gap between rich and poor in American society, the fact that many Americans in a, a country of such affluence went to bed hungry every night. It also uh, emphasized the importance of equal rights for women. And so this document really, represents, I think, a kind of brief recrudescence of what I call progressive evangelicalism in American life. And uh, to a remarkable degree, I think Jimmy Carter's campaign for the presidency in 1976 drew on many of those same themes. I'm not prepared to argue that that's progressive evangelicals put him in the White House. That's not the case at all. But uh, it's remarkable to me the confluence between these two, uh, two uh, uh, movements, that is the Chicago Declaration and Jimmy Carter's uh, agenda for the, the, the White House when he ran for president in the mid-1970s. Uh, what happens then, of course, is that during Carter's uh, administration, you have the rise of the religious right in response to IRS uh, uh, overtures against uh, so-called segregation academies. Uh, the, the midterm elections in 1978, Paul Weyrich discovers the abortion issue as an issue that will galvanize grassroots evangelicals. And of course, in 1980, Ronald Reagan defeats uh, Jimmy Carter and uh, uh, prepares the way for the, for, the, uh, for the religious right to have uh, its influence in American politics. George W. Bush in the 1980s, of course, has this very, very interesting series of, co of uh, conversions, which for evangelicals, by the way, is not unusual to have more than one conversion. In uh, 1984, you had the Arthur Blessett conversion in Midland, Texas, uh, after a long uh, luncheon meeting. Uh, a year later, you had the Billy Graham conversion, uh, where I sometimes call this the White House version because Billy Graham was a bit more uh, <laughs> reputable than uh, Arthur Blessett, who was a bit of a character. Uh, when, uh, according to official accounts, uh, Billy Graham was visiting with the, Walk with the uh, Bush family up at Walker's Point, and uh, George W. Bush and Billy Graham had this long walk on the beach, and at the conclusion of which George W. Bush makes a rededication of his life to Jesus. There are, of course, problems with that account. Uh, Billy Graham, even when he was lucid, uh, had no recollection of this, and of course uh, there is no beach at Walker's Point. Uh, the following year then, uh, George Bush gives up alcohol, which I think probably qualifies as a third conversion. And I think uh, this puts him, of course, on the road to the White House uh, after being governor of Texas. 2000 election, I sometimes refer to it, this as uh, an election where you see salvation by proxy. That is to say, George W. Bush had turned his life around uh, quite dramatically and, and, and quite persuasively. And I think he was arguing, in effect, in the 2000 campaign that he could do the same for the country after the tawdriness of the Clinton scandals and the Monica, Monica Lewinsky uh, 
business uh, and, and so forth. So uh, what I'm trying to frame here is that there really, really has been, for the last half century or so, a kind of contestation between progressive evangelicalism and the evangelicalism that has been embodied in the religious right, and that has had enormous policy implications back and forth. In some sense, it's not a contest at all. The religious right has prevailed in that context, in part because uh, the leaders of the religious right, unlike people like Jim Wallace and of Sojourners and others, Ron Sider and uh, Tony Campolo, leaders of the religious right have had their own media empires behind them to, in order to push their agenda. Until he retired just a couple of years ago, James Dobson was on 600 radio stations every day for half an hour. That's a lot of media exposure. It's something that can't, hasn't been matched by the religious, religious right. Um, so I, just in conclusion, I think the faith-based initiatives really represented a nod in the direction of progressive evangelicalism as embodied by the activities of 19th century evangelicals. But it was also one that was consistent with the small government orthodoxy of uh, the Republican Party. Thank you. Thanks, thanks for being here. Thanks again to uh, Hofstra for, uh, for hosting this for the paper, which was very interesting to both to read and to hear the overview. And John DiUlio, my close friend, uh, I'm always glad to see him. And Professor Balmer, it's great to, uh, to be with you. I know of your work, so it was good to, to hear it. Um, you know, in terms of the people who were in the White House, John was, was the person, as you said, who had the worm's eye view. He, he was the expert on it. So I'm, I'm going to just reflect a little bit, maybe pull the lens back a little, give some thoughts on um, the, the faith-based initiative itself and, and, and then pull back the lens a little bit more and, and give some very brief thoughts on my interpretation as someone who worked uh, in the White House for, uh, for seven years, uh, the role that faith played generally, and as I understood it, as I interpreted it in, in President Bush and, and his presidency. Um, but first, for what Mr. Balmer said about that, I, I think that's quite right and I, uh, in terms of what the faith-based initiative was in some respects. Uh, a leap back as well as a leap forward, uh, that it was an effort to recapture some of the spirit of the 19th century as were more progressive evangelical um, efforts uh, that it was noted for. Uh, the role of, of religion in public life in American history is a complicated and variegated thing, uh, and uh, it manifests itself in, in different ways. Uh, and I think that uh, that the spirit behind the faith-based initiative was much more toward the, those on the margins of society, um, which was not the kind of thing that, that really uh, faith in public life was characterized uh, by from really the early and mid-1970s uh, up until really, I think, the last few years when the religious right has essentially collapsed and run out of steam, and we're now in a transition moment, and we'll see what, what arises from it. But there were these efforts in which the, quite right with the IRS ruling, you had Roe v. Wade, uh, you had uh, efforts at uh, busing uh, that sort of galvanized uh, uh, a lot of religious families. And what happened was that um, the religious conservatives became a kind of the, the tip of the spear in what became known as the culture wars. Uh, and that really lasted for, for a long period of time. Um, and so that was sort of the dominant characteristic. The faith-based initiative tapped into a very different, I think, um, spirit, which I think explains some of the, some of the problems that we had. Um, the faith-based initiative is, is an initiative of George W. Bush, but it was based really on, I think, in large part, the faith of George W. Bush. And as was just recounted, there was, the, there was for him, I think, the very personal side of it. This was something that had transformed his life in a lot of ways, I think probably the drinking, uh, giving up drinking, was was one of the key moments. It's one of the issues he deals with in his book, uh, Decision Points, one of the pivots in his life. Um, and so because that was important to him and he saw the power in his own life, I think that he extrapolated out of that to see the power in other other lives. Um, but it wasn't just the power of, other li of, of his own life. I think it was the power that it had uh, in the lives of other people. And so this was something that was very real to him when he was governor of, of Texas. And, and if you spoke to him at that time, people who were with him, uh, he saw the kind of transforming effect that these faith-based institutions in Texas had. And he wanted to, uh, 
uh, to expand that when, when he became president. Um, so to understand the faith-based initiative, I do think it's important uh, to understand the role of faith uh, in, in George W. Bush's um, life. Uh, the second thing uh, I'd say is, uh, and, and John, can you correct me, uh, anybody can correct me the, if, if they think I'm wrong on this. I don't think that there was any other initiative that I can think of where there was a larger gap between what the president wanted to do and what most of the White House staff and the rest of the administration wanted to do. Um, I, it's a kind of odd thing to say, but this was something that he cared very much about, galvanized him in an earlier session. John made reference to the president saying, why get on my dance card more? Uh, I want to see you more. Why aren't we doing more of this? And uh, it's sometimes like uh, the uh, captain of a ship uh, turning the steering wheel and the ship keeps going in the same direction and he keeps turning the wheel and it never turns. And then you go down and you see that someone's cut the cords between you know, the, the, the steering wheel and the rudder. And so I just had a sense that this was something that just didn't have the kind of energy. There were some people, admirable people, uh, John, I think, uh, Prima Center Paris among, among the people who, who cared about this. But you, we just didn't have the kind of support system that we would have had and that we had on, on, uh, on other issues. So that's just my observation. Uh, the third point I'd say is that <clears throat> we ran into something of a bus on Capitol Hill. Uh, precisely, I think, because of what I described in terms of the religious right and the more cultural war aspects of it, this was just not an issue that a lot of Republicans cared very much about. Uh, John knew this firsthand, but my sense of it, my more limited experience and my observations on it was, you know, they, Capitol Hill Republicans would return phone calls on it and you could have meetings on it. But it was just a check the box quality. This is not something that animated them that they were that they were passionate about. So that was one problem, which was I think that there was uh, th there wasn't a base of support within the Republican Party uh, or the conservative movement for it. Um, and then in, on the liberal side, uh, there was suspicions of it, partly because it was President Bush and and because he was uh, a Republican, and there were Democrats. And so uh, the kind of thing that if it had come from a Democratic president, they probably would have been all, all on board. It just didn't, didn't work. And w one shouldn't uh, underestimate nor overestimate the effect of the Florida recount, uh, which, which poisoned the waters. It had nothing to do with what George W. Bush or Al Gore did. It's just the way it happened. And a lot of the partisans and a lot of members of both parties really got their back up. It was a very intense period. We kind of forget it now. But this was not an auspicious way to begin a presidency. And I think that there was same layover effect. And there was also a, a skepticism uh, within elements of, of liberalism, the Democratic Party, but as John said, even Arlen Specter, where there's just a sort of suspicion of faith uh, and the role of government. And, and I'm not even saying that that's, I, I think there's reason to have some suspicion about that if you look through American history. Uh, but I think that there was a predilection, a disposition to, to, to be fearful of that on the Democratic side. So I don't think that you had, as this initiative went forward, the kind of support on Capitol Hill or the two, two parties that, um, that I would have liked to have uh, seen. Um, and then you did have this thing called the War on Terror intervene. Uh, and uh, I can just say, as I was deputy director of speech writing at the time, I later became director of something called the Office of Strategic Initiatives, but I was there on 9-11. And, you know, everything was knocked in a cocked hat after that. The things that we had planned were, were pushed off the table. Uh, we were actually on the morning of 9-11 uh, when I called my colleague Mike Gerson, the President's Chief Speech Writer. He was at home when the um, Twin Towers were hit, uh, and he was at home working on a community of character speech which was uh, one of the initiatives that we were, we were trying to get ready for the, uh, for the fall. Um, all of that stuff got knocked out, and th there was a hyper-focus uh, on, uh, on the war on terror um, in ways that you can't even imagine. I mean, things large and small, and things that are classified and, and unclassified rhetorically and, and, and everything else. So that surely had some kind of an influence on this. As John said, he had, he, he had the legislation in his, in his uh, uh, coat pocket that could have moved this thing, and, but, um, but events interceded. Um, just uh, then a couple of brief thoughts, and we'll go to Q&A and, and a larger discussion about 
the role of faith in President Bush's life, apart from what, what I said, which was it had a transforming effect in, uh, on drinking and in other ways. Um, we were, John and I were talking to a class earlier about this, but, but I wanted to um, echo what I, what I had said there. In my experience, uh, you know, faith has a different effect on people, uh, depending on what your own personality and temperament and predilections are. Um, and I think, for example, you mentioned Billy Graham, and I think his son, Franklin Graham, um, my, my own estimation, he, he does a lot of good with Samaritan's Purse, but I see what, what his faith has done is to give him a mindset that, that I would uh, characterize as more judgmental. Uh, that's just the way that it plays out in his, he, he has a certain view, he interprets life and history through a certain prism that, that assumes the United States is kind of the model of Israel in the Old Testament, uh, that he believes that the country is becoming decadent and turning its back on God and, and that judgment uh, of, of God will come, the wrath of God will come, and that it's the responsibility of, uh, of him and of Christian leaders to warn the nation almost like an Old Testament prophet. Now, that's the way it works out for some people uh, in, in terms of their rhetoric and their disposition. I think Christian faith had a very different effect on George W. Bush. I think it sanded off some of his rougher edges. Uh, I think it made him a more uh, tender person. He's a person who is um, temperamentally, he can, he can be uh, quick and sharp and, and, uh, and you know, a person kind of in a hurry. Uh, direct. Uh, he's, he's, a, he's a wonderful guy. He, he's got a witty tongue. It could be a sharper tongue, but I think faith sort of softened those aspects uh, of him and made him a better and, and, uh, and more decent person. The other thing is, I don't think he would use these terms, but, but I'll use them instead, is I think it, it uh, affected his view of human anthropology. Of the, of the nature and dignity of the human person. Um, he never, in my, in my view, made these sort of simplistic um, calculations or simplistic uh, connection of the dots of saying, well, you know, scripture or the Bible says X and I'm gonna connect the dots and therefore, you, you know, if you're a faithful Christian, you're gonna support, you know, you know cutting the capital gain gains tax rate or any of a number of other things. He never got into that kind of a simplistic game, but I do think that it affected his view on certain issues. If you're a person of faith, I am. Uh, it can't help but, but, but shape that. And I do think that on certain issues of which the faith-based initiative is one, I actually think on immigration uh, is a second. I think the uh, uh, Global AIDS Initiative, PETFAR, Malaria Initiative, I think faith helped shape that. Um, and I think the, the role of human rights in foreign policy. Um, and if you, if you ever heard the president talk about uh, Kim Jong-il and what he was doing to the people of, of, uh, of North Korea, um, there, there would have been a, a deep and genuine offense at what this was doing to, 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 to people as human beings. Um, so my experience in any event was that, that uh, his Christian faith animated him, um, and it did manifest itself, but it, in, I think, much more complicated ways than s some people have created urban, urban myths about, um, uh, about him. Um, and a, f a final point is, you know, the faith-based initiative was the first of its, of its kind, and these things, uh, it's still in place, it's still going on. It doesn't really get as much attention in the Obama presidency as the Bush presidency. But um, it's going to be there for the next president. Uh, that individual may give it more attention than it's getting now. Uh, I can't imagine that they're going to undo it. And um, it's always a mistake to assume that the first time that these things are done, that that's the end product. Um, the, uh, you know, history unfolds and, and these efforts go on and, and, and they transform in many ways. Um, so it'll be interesting to see uh, when Hofstra has this event. Uh, 10 years from now or whenever to, to see what's, uh, what's happened to it. But I think it was, uh, it was conceived uh, in, in, in good intentions. I think it achieved good things. And, and my hope is that uh, as that time unwinds, uh, more good will come from it. So thanks very much. And we'll take your questions.
Thanks very much to all our speakers. I wonder if the paper presenters have anything you'd like to respond to the discussants before we open the floor. I would just like to, to ask Mr. Wiener, um, since you were in the, the um, speech writing shop, um, what, I, I, we do find it very curious that there wasn't more credit claiming on this issue. And you mentioned um, that this is a very personal issue for Bush. Do you think there was any um, pulling back on that because it was such a, a personal issue? Was it unseemly to, to claim credit on this particular issue from Bush's perspective? Did that get kind of maybe consciously or even subconsciously translated into what was happening in the speechwriter's shop? Um, is that a potential explanation for why there wasn't more um, claiming credit on the things that actually had been done on this issue? Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. I hadn't, before reading the paper and hearing your comments, I hadn't really thought that much about it. I think you're quite right in it. Um, but, but I hadn't given enough thoughts on why I was puzzling over, frankly, based on what you, what you said. I, I think the explanations that John gave were, 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 uh, were pretty good. Um, it may be that uh, because of the transition from kind of legislation to executive order, that it never really came out exactly as he wanted. Um, the speeches, just the way it worked in, in our shop, I imagine it's this case for most of the um, of, of the uh, uh, White Houses and presidencies, is that you have a communication shop and they're in touch with different people and you are as a speechwriter essentially, most of the time you're, set, you're told the president's gonna do a speech here, let's do some remarks. So the ideas don't really get generated for the most part uh, from the speech writing shop. It's more of a place where, where we execute it. Now that wasn't always the case, and I think it, in the Bush presidency, the speech writing shop had probably more influence than most presidencies, based really largely on the relationship that Mike Gerson had with President Bush, which is a very close relationship. Mike had a lot of influence with him. And so Mike wasn't simply a speechwriter, but he was he was a person of of who was able to advocate as he did for the for the PEPFAR initiative. Um, it may be that, uh, I, as I said, I suspect or said that I suspect the war on terrorism had something to do with it. And I'm guessing that, you know, in the run up to the 2004 election, when you do have to focus your attention on on winning an election, it was an issue that just didn't do. Uh, much. There were other things that have to claim it, you had to do, and um, and it didn't really inspire, unfortunately, to in my estimation, conservatives and Republicans, um, and so it probably didn't make uh, appearances in the uh, in in the lead up to the election uh, that it um, that it should have. But it, it's a it's a good and it's a fair question, uh, and and I, I'm not sure that I do have a sufficient answer to it. Very good. So I've seen here in the, in the initial paper on the rhetorical push or uh, lack thereof behind George Bush's promotion of the faith-based initiative and the worm's eye view and the speechwriter's perspective and the context in the history of evangelicalism. What I see overall is just rich terrain for understanding a much more complicated area in terms of in terms of how we usually divide up the political spectrum, that we have you know, a faith-based initiative proposed by someone who is usually placed in among conservative evangelicals who could have taken a page from the Chicago progressives uh, platform in 1973. So this is a rich terrain, and with this I open it up to your questions for all our panelists. I'm going to ask if there's a microphone and student in the audience, wonderful. So please raise your hand and our student will come to you with the microphone so you can speak into the mic. While we're waiting, can I just pick up on, on Peter's comment about the genuineness of, of, of George Bush's conversion? Uh, I, I think in year 2000, he made a comment that had it not been for Jesus, he would be holding up a bar somewhere in Texas. I mean, holding up, not 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 robbing it, but yeah. <laughs> leaning yeah. into a bar somewhere in Texas rather than the Oval Office. So yeah. he, he certainly recognized that. Yeah, himself. that's a fair point. Um, my question is, what was the transition like for the Bush administration to the Obama administration in terms of the Office of uh, Faith-Based Initiatives? Do you, do you, uh, well, I, I, why don't you go on that? I'll well, I, I, uh, I happen to be a Democrat, 
Uh, and so I was at the, you know, I went to the Colorado Convention in 2008, and I, um, I didn't have a hand in writing, but I got to review and make a couple of comments on tweet um, the speech that President Obama, eventually became President Obama, gave in Zanesville, Ohio, uh, in the run-up. So it was his sort of faith-based speech. And the, they made two or three very self-conscious decisions. Um, to first, the first being a relation to the Office of Faith-Based and Community Initiatives. The first was to keep the office, but to rename it and to change it from community initiatives to neighborhood partnerships, okay? Which, you know, which was, a, was significant in that their vision of it in some sense was, they were essentially signaling more continuity than not with that change because the way that the Bush initiative had been framed was really about neighborhood partnerships. It was about, you know, oddly enough, some would say in retrospect, uh, given all the controversies and all, really was primarily about leveling the playing field for the smaller community-based uh, urban congregations that were, you know, doing, had been doing social service delivery forever, but had been debarred from or discriminated against in the uh, grant-making process, whether intentionally or just because of bureaucratic protocols. So they made that very conscious decision uh, to sort of express continuity, White House Office of Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships, not Community Issues. Second thing they decided to do was to expand it. Um, and that also was a pretty easy decision for them. They uh, wanted to take the five faith-based centers that uh, we'd established in five cabinet agencies and put them in all cabinet agencies as well as the Corporation for National and Community Service. And they also wanted to uh, do that in a way that would extend to the uh, foreign affairs, uh, even beyond what, not beyond PEPFAR, but beyond what the USAID had done. So that President Obama was very, so again, self-conscious and intentional about that. What they decided to do, however, in that context was to take the emphasis off of fundraising or, or grant making and put the emphasis more on access and setting a, a broad table and clarifying and rationalizing federal law, which leads to the third uh, thing, which is, I think, interesting in light of you know, the executive order of, of December uh, 2002. President Obama was expected by a number of people at, when, when Al Gore embraced faith-based as he did in the run up to the 2000 election, he got a tremendous amount of pushback from the party's base and essentially watered it down and you know, kind of almost wrote, wrote, you know, wrote it out of the 2000 platform. It was there, but it's, it's very anemic. When Barack Obama gave the Zanesville speech, he got a tremendous amount of pushback, but he didn't, he didn't um, vacillate quite as much, but he, and on, and on one thing, he did something that remains highly unpopular, which is he has not repealed uh, that December 2002 order and has actually extended uh, it, especially with respect to the funding through, you know, through USAID of organizations like World Vision and so forth. Now, um, that in part, I think, was a decision made because to, this gets back to your question about the credit claiming. Um, I think what the Obama administration learned from the, I mean, if you talk to Reverend Josh Dubois, a wonderful young man who served in the first uh, four, four or five years of the Obama administration as the faith-based director, or you talk to Dr. Melissa Rogers, the present director, what they will tell you is, I think, well, Reverend Dubois would tell you, I'm not sure what Dr. Rogers would tell you just now, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but that, that basically, you know, to claim credit, which, you know, the Obama administration has given out substantial uh, grants uh, in this area, but to claim credit is to wave a red flag in front of the very people on both sides of the aisle who don't like what you're doing. So I think there's a, I don't know if the Bush administration was self-conscious about that, but I think the Obama administration was intentional about basically not making a big deal about it, even though they have, you know, more than doubled the number of faith-based centers, even though they've expanded the international funding, and even though they have not changed the single most controversial policy of the Bush faith-based initiative. Uh, first, thanks to the panelists. This already sort of expanded my sense of, of how we talk about these things. Um, I've got lots of questions, but I, I think I'd like to start with us um, hearing you guys reflect a bit on the extent to which, and, and Professor 
Peter, Peter Wiener talked about this earlier, but the extent to which there, the faith-based initiative was a political tool that was assumed to, you know, that was going to garner a certain kind of support, and then it didn't seem to do that. So, I mean, in terms of the second election and what happened, and I'm, I'm, I'd like to hear you talk some more about whether or not that was, uh, it goes back to the, the fact that uh, there was some tension between the left and the right-wing evangelicals, or if it, it's, I mean, I'm trying to think of, I mean, why did, why, why wasn't it more successful as a galvanizing tool? It seemed to look like it from the outside that it was going to be useful and going to help to crystallize things. Um, so this is, as I said, I'm just reacting to what I heard you say. Yeah, I'll, I'll take for Sean, and then others can can weigh in in terms of uh, you know being a uh, uh, a political tool. Um, uh, that was not the you know the basis of it, as as we've all many of us, several of us have talked about. This was something that was sort of organic to George W. Bush. It was key to understand the person he was, what he had experienced in um, in Texas, uh, and. <clears throat> so that that was what it uh, what, what it sprung from. Um, I, I think that it that it was probably helpful in 2000 uh, in terms of projecting a, a, a different and I think a better image of the Republican Party um, in in a way, for example, that I think education did and compassionate conservatism as a as a term did. Um, and I don't have any problem with that. I mean, politics is the, because because it was not a cynical attempt. It was something that was genuine. But I have no problem in people putting it forward to the voters in a, the most uh, the wisest and smartest way possible to try and help you get uh, get elected. Um, so I think in the, in the wake of the uh, you know uh, uh, Gingrich era, which which was pretty contentious. Uh, Newt Gingrich, though he led the you know ninety four take over the Republican Party after Democrats had controlled it for forty years, by the time George W. Bush was was running in ninety nine, uh, there were a lot of negative feelings toward Republicans in part because of the impeachment hearings and all of that, and so I think George W. Bush did somewhat m more minor version of what I think Bill Clinton had done with the Democratic Party in ninety two and Tony Blair had done with the Labor Party. In, uh, in 94, 90, 95, which is to recast it in the mind of the public, not to fundamentally alter the party, but to take sort of certain set of issues and, and, and rhetoric and to signal to the public, this is a somewhat different party than, than, you've, uh, than you've known, and I'm a somewhat different candidate. Um, but even the term <clears throat> compassionate conservatism is one that a lot of conservatives didn't like because they felt like it was a modifier of something that, that uh, they felt was an insult to them because it, it, the argument from the right was, well, this assumes that conservatives aren't compassionate uh, and, uh, and so you sort of thrown this label on. So that kind of fed into the point I was, was making. This just never had a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, support within, within the, the base of the party. And I think by the time you got to 2004, that was just a national security uh, election at that point. That was really the main argument that was, that was going on. Um, that was the main thrust of what the Democrats and John Kerry went at, at President Bush with, and that was the main thrust of which we went at them. And so the context and terrain was just different, not as amenable to to, uh, to faith-based as it was in uh, uh, in 2000. I, you know, I'm going to give a, essentially the same answer you just heard. I'm, uh, I'm going to uh, kind of put. I'm going to go sort of constituency by constituency, okay, and sort of then do the math, right? Um, President opens with that February uh, 2001 address, not a State of the Union, but the budget address. And sitting in the gallery uh, is uh, very intentionally my mayor, Philadelphia then, uh, John Street, who is an African-American mayor, second African-American mayor of Philadelphia. Uh, in Philadelphia, we beat President Bush by 400,000 votes. Uh, he notes that in the speech and says, but nonetheless, Mr. Mayor, we're going to work together because Democratic mayors really, really got it. I mean, Jerry Brown, then of Oakland, and 
you know, Mark Morial of New Orleans, uh, then president of the mayors, I mean, the Democratic mayors were all over this and all for it. But here is the problem. The res response to that, you know, moment, gallery moment, was essentially the president got no credit and Mayor Street caught uh, double H hockey sticks, right? Be from the Democrats. Why? Because as Mr. Weiner says, Pete said, we were in the context still of the Florida vote count controversy. And it was, a, those, those wells had been poisoned. And many Democrats said, right, you know, under normal circumstances, I might go for this. But, you know, in these circumstances, no matter what the bill says, or no matter what he does, we're not going to go for it. So just get that through your heads. And, and they were pretty much true to their word. So they weren't going to go for it. Okay. Then you have the evangelicals. Okay. And you know Jim Wallace, a good you know, been a friend, and 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 Ron, and Ron Sider, a very good friend of mine, and uh, Tony Campolo, and all those great progressive evangelicals. But as the professor pointed out, how many divisions does the Pope have? Uh, not not many. So while there is this tradition, uh, it doesn't have the political uh, force of the religious right. And lo and behold, those evangelicals, um, once they understood that this was not an agenda for you know the compassionate conservatism is not going to turn out to be libertarianism and religious drag, you know, <laughs> give everything back to the religious groups uh, and then let the government get completely out of the business of Medicaid and, you know, just leave it all to ministry. That was clearly not what George W. Bush was talking about. He did not have that vision. So they stepped out, right? And then you can, you can keep going, right? The Catholics are, are kind of supportive. But they are they can't decide whether they want whether they're concerned because does this mean the Catholic Charities is going to have to sort of, you know, be devolved into smaller groups and so forth, or the big ones, Lutheran Social Services, right? So they, they have their concerns about what does this really mean for us, right, in terms of the, the, the politics, if you will, of grant making on the one side. But on the other side, they also want a conscience clause. And they also want what some of the events, so there's an ecumenism of the trenches there with the evangelicals. And then, you know, cut the camera to inside the White House, as, as Pete mentioned. You had uh, the president, who was all for it, right? But you had really nice, really good people who just, you know, very complicated, difficult circumstances. And I believe in Shirley Ann Warshaw's book, she quotes our uh, former colleague, uh, Nick Callio, uh, basically saying, look, you know, I, he personally didn't think a whole lot of it, but, but beside, he just had a lot of other stuff that he had to negotiate. And so if Dick Armey is telling you, I don't even want to talk about this. And you're trying to get No Child Left Behind with Ted Kennedy. You're trying to get him to swallow that. Mm -hmm. You know, something's going to get kicked to the curb. So just about everything that, you know, just about every aspect of this, right, was, was bollocksed. Uh, but it had one thing, and it, and it persisted throughout, even though you're absolutely right, the, the rhetoric and the speeches and so forth, forth. It had one asset that was irresistible and unavoidable, and that was George W. Bush's commitment to it, which persisted despite all that. Which, which really seems to, I think, bolster the case for administrative action. So it makes sense why he didn't act as a chief legislator and he acted as a chief administrator or a chief executive. It wasn't going anywhere. Right. right. Legislatively, it was going nowhere. Yeah. I might ask a question that uh, speaks to Professor Balmer's um, quick run through the history of evangelicalism and, and giving us that context. I know it wasn't a, a major component of your presentation, and you might have wanted just to slip it in or not at all, but to, to go back to what you were saying about um, that, you know, the faith-based initiative, you know, accords with so much of progressive evangelicalism, and yet there should not have been a need for the faith-based faith initiative in that there's, you know, a whole context that's taken for granted in discussion of this, which is the uh, tax exemption of, of religious bodies that in itself is supposed to be um, um, a, a component of, of their ability to do things. Right. If you could return to that and yeah. just give us more of that context, it would be great. It's not a very popular sentiment when I express it to, especially to executives of tax exempt organizations. <laughs> but I, but this confu the, actually this fundamental confusion was behind the rise of the religious right to begin with, because uh, the Green v. Connolly decision in 1971 said 
that any organization that engages in racial segregation or racial discrimination is not, by definition, a charitable institution. That was directed at the so-called segregation academies, later to Bob Jones University, and that's what gets the re religious right going as a, as a, as a, as a political movement. And the, the defense, or, or the, 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 the outcry was, the government is trying to tell us what to do. And we don't accept any federal money, so we have the, we're not uh, obliged to do that. Well, the flaw, of the, flaw, the flaw in that logic is that tax exemption amounts to public subsidy. It does. Um, I was rector of a, I'm also an Episcopal priest, I was the rector of a, a parish in uh, Washington, Connecticut, in northwestern Connecticut for a while. And uh, it was a very affluent town. The church sat on top of the hill uh, the property in, was very valuable. We paid no property taxes. No church does. No, no Hofstra doesn't either, unless they do so voluntarily. Which meant that everybody else in town in Washington had to subsidize public services for what we were not paying. That's public subsidy. So that was a flaw behind the logic behind the rise of religious right in the 1970s. Uh, you know, my point about the the Great Depression and the 19th century evangelicalism is that, particularly evangelicals, but other religious groups as well in the 19th century really did shoulder responsibility for social care, for, for social action. You go into any even mid-sized city in America, you'll see probably either a Mercy Hospital or a Lutheran Hospital or a Baptist Hospital. This is what religious groups did. And I think what happens in the Great Depression, as I said earlier, is that uh, the the, uh, the social condition, the social uh, uh, situation was so dire that the federal government s stepped in to deliver these so sorts of services. And by logic, once the economy recovered, these religious groups should have resumed that task in society, but they never did. And that's what gave rise to the need for something like the faith-based initiatives. If I can just extend that, so I think you're absolutely right uh, in, in in the history, and one of the things that the also <laughs> helped to bollocks the faith-based initiative was it raised to public consciousness for a brief uh, period the fact that the non so the nonprofit sector in America today is a three trillion dollar a year sector. It's $3 trillion a year in revenue. That's almost what state and local governments totally spend. It's, a, it's 11 to 12% of all employment, and it has grown more dramatically than either the for-profit sector or the government sector over the past 20 years, okay? And, and you know, I've spent my virtually my whole life in the nonprofit sector, you know, uh, many, many, many academics uh, have. And basically, what the faith-based initiative did, I mean, amidst all the other controversy between the religious conservatives and the progressives and uh, the, the Catholics and all the other groups and the secularists and all, all that business aside, it brought to public attention this very uncomfortable fact. So who are these groups? Well, they get tax-exempt property, right? They get tax-deductible donations. They may get grants or, or, you know, sort of subsidies to their, you know, to their customers, you know, we call them college loans. Um, and finally, they may get actual grants and contracts to the organization. So, so it's, a, it's not a trifecta ticket, it's four things you get for being, if you get them all. Now, the point was that the only nonprofits that seemed unable to access all four of those goodies were those smaller community serving religious organizations that guess what? If you gave them a dollar, they gave you almost a dollar plus back in value as opposed to the large religious and other nonprofits that, let's face it, were pretty much had gotten used to using middlemen and giving the smaller nonprofits the crumbs from their table. So this was a, I can tell you, and I will still not say on the record who they were, but I will tell you that I had, I saw the heads of just about every major religious, large national and international nonprofit during my first 10 days in the White House. <laughs> and they were not there to discuss you know, constitutional theory. They wanted to know whether this was a parade, whether this mob could be turned into a parade in their honor that they can get out in front of and lead. Because it, they understood quite clearly that if you, if you allow these small religious nonprofits, often 
the ones that had the least valuable property and the least, you know, and the poorest neighborhoods and places to compete equally and on their own rather than have the big guys intermediate them, you, you, ha you could have a, a minor revolution in that piece of federal grant making. And they wanted none of it. Um, I think this is a question principally for Professor Balmer, but I guess I would be curious to hear the entire panel talk about it if they want to. Um, I, I, as an academic, have become increasingly concerned with the usage and promotion of the term religious right. There, there, there's kind of a threat construction behind it that is, that's starting to alarm me a little bit. I guess it really kind of crossed a red line for me when uh, one month after the 2008 election, uh, Sarah Palin's church would burn with women and children inside of it. Uh, very little was said about it, very little commentary. There was, of course, the shooting at the Family Research Council in Washington, D.C. And uh, I, even just the, the, the gentle rub about, you know, what is progressive, what's not progressive. There was a, a First Lady panel this morning about whether it had an or in it about whether Laura Bush was a conservative uh, Christian or a progressive humanitarian. And, and then I think the, the moderator sort of rightly responded like, well, what, what's the binary there? Why are we juxtaposing those things? And I just wonder, especially for Professor, Professor Balmer, because we've, we've been using this term for decades now about the religious right, you know, and it's kind of this dangerous group. Are they really that dangerous? Are they really, or, or is there any way to de-escalate this rhetoric to where this kind of civility, and we would admit that Sarah Palin or you know, again, even that Ted Cruz at Liberty University would be allowed to announce his candidacy without some sort of threat construction that the religious right is coming to get us. Uh, I guess that's my question. I mean, obviously, Professor Balmer, I think, would want to answer that, but maybe the others want to talk about that, too. What would you prefer? Uh, Christian, evangelical, uh, and, and just some sort of openness about what, who's progressive, who's not. Yeah. I, yeah, I... I I, would, I have two responses to that. First of all, the, the architects of the religious right actually were quite self-conscious about moving beyond Christianity in their co in, in the attempt to build the coalition. So they were trying to tap into certainly conservative Catholics, but also conservative Jews, Mormons, and other groups. So it, that was the intent behind it. The other objection I have to the term Christian right is that I think it suggests that all Christians are, are politically conservative. And I, that's simply not the case. Uh, and, and certainly not even all evangelicals are, are politically conservative. So uh, until I hear a better term, I, I don't, I'm not sure, I, 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 I'll stick with it. Yeah, I, I'll have a couple of thoughts because I think I, I may have used the term religious, religious right. I, uh, and just in the interest of full disclosure, I'm a, uh, I'm an evangelical Christian and a conservative. Um, uh, so I don't think that the term itself, certainly I don't think there's anything intrinsically wrong. Uh, this professor's right. It's if, if you go back and you, and you study the history of kind of Falwell and, and, and that movement, it was not restricted just to Christians, although, although it was. And right is often a term, of, and, and I use it too in my own writing. Sometimes you get tired of saying conservative all the time. So you say people on the right instead of conservatives. It's certainly true that, that there are pejoratives that are associated uh, in, in the wider culture and certainly in the media with the religious right. Um, and I think that's in part explained because um, a lot of people in, in the media are social liberals. Uh, and so they don't like the, the aims of what, uh, what conservative Christians, those people who are religious right, want, uh, uh, want to do. Uh, and in my own writings, I've praised uh, the, the, the people on the right for some of the efforts they made. I think, it, I think it was Richard John Newhouse that referred to that movement as a defensive, you know, offensive. That is, that there was a whole series of actions where these people, because of the fundamentalist, fundamentalist modernist controversy in the early part of the 20th century, they were on the sidelines and, and, and they, were, they, they got involved to some extent um, despite themselves and what they, what they, uh, what they wanted. Uh, but I will also say as somebody, I think frankly because I am a conservative and a Christian, I, I just think that people who have represented uh, 
Christianity in conservative circles and in active in politics have hurt them, the Christian faith, more than they've hurt the political uh, faith. I think that there was a kind of vulgarization of faith, and, and I don't think it's exclusive to the right. I think um, I've certainly had my disagreements with Jim Wallace and some of the rhetoric that he used, including calling uh, George W. Bush and Dick Cheney war criminals who should, who, who I can't remember, he thought they should spend life in prison or be hanged or something. But so look, there's a, there's a double standard going on. But um, but I do think that there are people who. Um, who took Christianity and conformed it and, and to some extent, frankly, subverted it to a political agenda. Um, and I just think that's dangerous. I think it's dangerous for politics, but I think it's dangerous for faith. Um, and I'm a Christian uh, in a deeper sense than I'm a conservative. And, um, and that's bothered me. Uh, and uh, so I think some of this is, is based on a certain kind of bias that's out there. But, but I also think that people who are conservative Christians have brought some of this uh, on themselves. And the last thing I'll say is, I just think that there's a, and, 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 and I will admit to it as much as probably anybody else, there's just a selectivity that goes on, on how people, and, and it's not just in, in, in faith, but in, in politics and philosophy in general, and how people decide sort of the order of their lives and what it is that they're gonna be uh, you know, uh, animated by. Uh, and so if you're, if you're a person of faith, how is it that you so select the issues that you do and decide that these are the ones that are central to, to, you know, to the heart of Jesus if you're a Christian or to the Christian faith? And, and I think that there's just a lot of confusion out there because I think some of the issues that people who are conservative Christians have chosen as their great galvanizing issues are frankly not ones that if you read the the Gospels and, and the entire Bible in its full, you would come away and say, well, these are the three or four issues that we're going to be. I don't, I'm not saying that they aren't relevant, um, I, but I am saying it's, it's incomplete and there's a selectivity. Your, your question, obviously, it, it's a bit of a nerve, right? Because it's a, it's a serious question and it's, uh, it's a difficult question um, because, you know, uh, it's, you know, the term religious right has been around forever. I'm not sure there's a better alternative to it, but I, I want to just... I, quickly, I want to reinforce or underline what, what, what we just heard you know, with just a quick anecdote or two. In, in March, of, March of 2001, I gave a speech um, to when I was you know, still directing the office to the National Association yeah. of Evangelicals. Now, I flew to Dallas and gave the speech. And I confess that it was, um, it was a harangue, uh, essentially. Uh, because I had gotten very tired of hearing that you know, religious conservatives were against the initiative because the initiative did not allow them to proselytize with public funds. You know, I just, I just had gotten, just, just had enough. And so I went there and in good professorial fashion for an hour harangued them about the fact that if they did believe that, which I didn't think most of them did anyway, that they should not claim to speak or presume to speak for African American and Latino ministers in places like Philadelphia and Detroit and South Central LA and so forth. Uh, on and on and on. So that, that created a certain ripple effect. But what was interesting was, when the speech was over, apart from certain individuals there, it got applause and actually got a standing ovation. The Washington Post and others reported it as if Bush, Faith, Czar, puts finger in eye of religious right, okay? I actually addressed evangelical Christians and I quoted President Bush, mostly his own words, back to them throughout most of the speech. The point I'm making is, that, and, and in response to that, I believe the late Reverend Falwell and, and Reverend Robertson called for the first time for my resignation um, uh, on the same day. Uh, the ACLU did. <laughs> so it was a, it was a banner day. Um, and, the, 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 and then after 9-11, it was, I believe, again, the late Reverend Falwell and Reverend Robertson who, who made statements about, you know, this is the wrath of God and so forth and so on. Now, unfortunately, right, uh, I think the vast majority of people we classify not only as progressive evangelicals, but as more conservative evangelicals, like my friend Pete Weiner here, are people who hold you know, strong views. I I'm a pro-life Catholic Democrat, right? So we have our annual convention in a phone booth, if there aren't any phone <laughs> booths anymore, right? So I share a lot. I was on the board of the prison fellowship ministry with the late, great Chuck Colson. There are great, th th those people were conservative evangelicals. I would not want to label them or you know, vilify them in the slightest with any bad term. But I think the problem is we've fallen into a situation where 
the media give the most attention to the most extreme voices, and those have been the most extreme. Now it's, with all due respect, it, you know, and it, you know, I'm not, you know, but Franklin Graham, I think, is kind of taken up that mantle to some extent. Um, I think it's unfortunate, but I think, you know, and he's, everyone has an entitled to express their views. We have a First Amendment, but I think that that's the problem. There's really not a space or place to talk about the vast number of, you know, for, if 38 to 40 percent of America is born again. Christians or evangelical Christians, surely there, there's a diversity of opinion there and there's a, you know, a distribution on a whole range of issues, whether it's environmental protection or creation care, however you want to talk about it. And it's unfortunate that we can't embrace, you know, societally and pluralistically our conservative evangelical brethren agree or disagree because we continue to get this sort of focus on what I believe then is now is a minority opinion within conservative evangelical my shorthand on Franklin Graham, by the way, is that Billy Graham famously, at an early point in his career, rejected the narrow fundamentalism of his childhood in favor of a broader, more capacious evangelicalism. Yep. Franklin Graham's done the opposite. <laughs> yeah, and Billy Graham, to his credit, learned from his mistakes in the in the Nixon years when he. Uh, uh, he, he, he's certainly a conservative politically, and I think that it was actually his wife, Ruth, you may know this, who sort of intervened and said, look, your, your involvement in politics is actually undermining your, your larger ministry. And to his credit, I think he learned from that. He did, but he still continued yes. to make those mistakes. Yeah, yeah. We are at the close of a, a panel that really has opened up so much um, literacy for those of us who know a lot and those of us who know a little, just adding so much more to you know, what this faith-based initiative meant, but also broader issues of how to define evangelicalism, um, complicating so much. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you to our paper presenters. Thank you to the audience, and enjoy the rest of the conference. Enjoyed it very much. Thanks. Thank you very much. That was great. Good job. Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, what are you doing? I'm going to leave. I've got a flight out of LaGuardia, so I want to go. What about you? When are you? I have a car. Something like that. That was very good. Because I can't.